I want a turbo car with an exhaust pipe that comes out the door and flames coming out of it. So I enjoy going fast in cars. Who doesn't? The best way to do in that right now, I think, is racing in the 24 hours of lemons. Now that's not Le Mans, it's lemons. And what that is, essentially, is start, they started this way by, you start with a $500 car, and supposedly, and you turn it into a race car, and you go racing. And they don't have any rules as far as how much you can spend on the safety items, cage, seat, fuel tank and things. So eventually these cars turn into race cars over time because you're spending money on them. But the idea is they start off as cheap jalopies. Anybody can get into it. And if you've got a fast car, there's a hundred and so odd cars in the track. You can pass three cars every corner if you want, if you're good at it. And it's a lot of fun. And you race for hours. It's two, usually two eight hour days, not actual 24 hours. So I got into this about a decade ago, a few years after it started, I moved back to California and a friend of mine's like, oh, you wanna do 24 hours of lemons? I was like, yeah, because I'd heard of lemons when they did the article. It was one of the reasons that where the 2904 idea came from was to do a, you know, a cheap version of something. And he's like, yeah, he goes, a bunch of buddies of mine from Tesla got a third gen Toyota Supra and we're gonna go race that. I'm like, that's a heavy car, but sure. And they're like, you've raced before, you've built race cars before. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Oh, by the way, the Tesla guys are out. Okay, he so it's just you and me for now. I'm like, so we're building the race car. He goes, no, you're building the race car. I'm like, so you're asking me on the team to build a race car? He's like, yeah. So we get a truck, we go down to Tesla and stuffed in the corner of this like secret warehouse with all this cool electronic stuff is this crappy broken down Supra. We drag it out of there, they're good to see it go. We get it back. I built it into a car, it had the stock 7M engine in it, and we're like, oh, that's right, we're supposed to have a theme. So I'm like, first theme, like, let's make a theme. All right, what's the theme? Uh, and we try to look at topical things, and at that point, 2010, it was Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we came up with for some reason. So we painted the car pink, and we covered it in phalluses in different directions that made it look like camouflage. So it was cock camouflage is what it was. And it was hard to tell, but that's what it looked like. And we went in military uniforms and nothing against the military. This was just kind of a joke. And Liz Taylor had just died. So we bit a big Liz Taylor thing on the backside of it. And uh, we proceeded to blow it up. Now we had done everything people told. They're like, oh, change the head studs on them because they didn't do them right from the factory. And we spent all this money and time. And it was a total piece of crap. And you have to do street tires. You can't do race tires and lemons. So we're on street tires. They stock everything. And it was dreadful. So instead of doing the smart thing and abandoning that car and burning it to the ground, uh, we decided to spend a lot of money and turn it more into a race car. So over the next few years, we spent some money. That engine was dreadful. So we blew up the 7M motor. I'm like, I'm not doing this again. Let's find something else. My teammate finds a 1JZ turbo engine. Now, for those who don't know what that is, that is this twin turbo monster motor, six cylinder monster motor from Japan. They didn't really have it in a lot of cars here in the US, but they had it in a car called the Chaser and the Soar. And the 2JZ became famous in the fourth generation Supra that which became even more famous uh, in Fast and the Furious. And then everybody had to have it. It was the drift engine, made all the chirpy fun sounds. So we got, we found one, this drift kid was trying to put in his car and just ran out of money. And we got it for 800 bucks. And every one Jay-Z guy right now is going, they're not 800 bucks. I'm like, we got it for 800 bucks. We stuffed it in the Supra and we showed up and we didn't know anything about turbo, racing turbo cars. I had always raced normally aspirated cars. I'd never build turbo car. So of course it has no intercooler on it. It has the old radiator, it overheats and it's a piece of junk. And then of course we show up and they're like, that's a one Jay-Z. Those make like a thousand horsepower. You can't have that here, that's horrible. And we're like, and I think Phil and the, and the judges were like, they're not gonna last five laps. And I think we lasted 10 before we popped it. And we took it home and I'm like, we can figure this out. So, oh, actually did some research, opened some books, got it going. And at the time I was working for Canapa and they have a crack team of uh, motorsports mechanics there. And we were good friends of mine. And they took pity on me. So 
We dragged the one Jay-Z Supra into the cannabis shop after hours and parked amongst the million dollar cars is this heap of a, of a Supra. And they proceed to corner weight it and show me how to do the suspension the way it was supposed to be done and all these little tricky things. I always loved seeing cheating in race cars. That's one of my favorite things. And, I, and it's a hobby to collect car cheats. The great thing about lemons is there's no rules against cheating. So I'm like, what can we do to this that's not allowed in real racing? I'm like, oh, well, if you're going to take the, the gloves off, we can do all kinds of things. Like weight jacking, where a weight in the back of the car actually moves from one side of the car to the other actively to keep it flat on the track. And I'm like, let's, let's do that. Uh, what else can we do? And so we had a, a list of things and we started putting cheaty things on it, legally cheaty things. But the guys at Lemon, especially Judge Phil, never liked the car because of the 1JZ. Every time we showed up, they were like, you're cheating. This is a cheaty engine. It's got a million horsepower. We're going to give you eight penalty laps or 10 penalty laps. After we got it sorted out, the car really started hustling. And we were going sub two minute laps at Sonoma in traffic on street tires. And there's some quick teams out there like Isor. They can do a sub two minute lap. There's a few of them. And I don't know if we're the best drivers in the world, but that car was quick. And they hated it even more. And at one point they gave us like 12 penalty laps and we still came in eighth place. And Judge Phil comes over. And this is, we've been racing for years at this point with it. And he comes over and he goes, this car can never win. He goes, I don't care if you do come in first place. I don't know, you're not getting a trophy. Nothing's gonna happen. This engine is a cheaty. It's not, you know, this is too obvious. A 1JZ and a Supra. He goes, it's not lemons. He goes, you can't win. And we, at that point, the closer you get to winning, the more money and time you're spending. That final 10% takes 90% of the time and money. Like you were trying to get there. And I'm like, is, is it worth chasing a crappy trophy at Lemons for all this? And I go, what do we have to do to get in your good graces? And Phil goes, okay, I'll make you a deal. You can either put a straight six out of a Ford pickup truck in your Supra and you run in class C, which is the lowest class, the slowest class, and I'll never give you a penalty lap again. Or you can race in class A, but you have to put your cheaty engine and everything in a pre-75 Toyota. And we're like, okay. No desire to go slow, ever. I'm like, no, don't want to Ford, in, no, don't want to do it. So we started looking around for pre-75 Toyota. Now the problem with a pre-75 Toyota is that they're made out of old sardine cans and what was left over after World War II, I'm assuming. It, they're not terribly structurally sound vehicles and that was the challenge. We look around and we find a Toyota Carina, which I didn't even know existed at the time. Bought it for, I think a thousand bucks. Now I know that's over the $500 limit. If you strip things out of the car and sell it, like we sold $500 in parts, the car is $500. So we figured we could do that. I put online, I didn't have taken it apart yet. I put online Toyota Carina for uh, parts for sale. Like I figured I could pre-sell all the stuff inside. And I got five or six emails immediately. Like, will you sell the car? Will you sell the car? I'm like, no, um, I need the car. I need the car, I, I can sell you the interior. And this one guy was like, I'll give you two grand. I said, no, goes, I'll give you three grand. I said, no, goes, I'll give you four grand. I said, maybe. And then he's like, can you deliver it to my house? And I'm like, for $4,400, I could deliver it to your house, which was all of 60 miles away. And I had a truck and trailer. And then I had to find another car. Interestingly enough, we had been talking to uh, some of the people at Lemons about Phil. And Phil's first car that he ever owned was a 1969 Toyota Corona four-door, which are these little box cars. And I found one in Stockton, which was only 30 miles from where I was dropping off the Carina. So I drove and dropped off the Carina in the morning, got my $4,400, drove down to Stockton, bought the uh, Corona for $1,000, <laughs> pocketed the rest of it, and drove home. And we're like, great, we've got the car. Phil's gonna freak out. We decide to drive it completely stock in, as a mea culpa. It still has the spiders in it, 70 series, 13 inch wheels, drum brakes, two speed automatic, wheezy engine. And I have to say, and I have to admit, and they were right, it was one of the best races I've ever been in. We caged it, we put a racing seat in it, stock dashboard, 
It was the slowest thing I think I'd ever been in in my life on a racetrack and terrifying. You drove the entire race with, a rear, with just a rear view mirror. You didn't even look in front of you. You were just looking for who was coming up behind. And eventually everybody got used to us staying on the inside, out of everybody's way, and we made lap after lap. And we beat Corvettes, and we beat BMWs, and we beat Mazdas, we beat a whole bunch of cars. I think we came in like, out of 140 cars, we came in like 68th place. Because we just stayed on the track and did laps. The car ended up getting like 30 something miles to the gallon. And in the 11 gallon gas tank, we would just go out and it was so calm and easy. I wasn't sweating or worrying about anything. We just put it around the track. We ended up winning their highest award, which is the index of effluency, which is the IOE. And that is the highest prize, has the highest money for driving the worst car and doing the most with it. We had paid our price, we had our patch, we got our money, and we're like, time to build the monster. So we take the Corona apart. And I have to say, aside from the tuna fish cans, that car came apart easier than any car I've ever done. We cracked one bolt, everything came off finger tight. And this is a 40 year old car that had been sitting on somebody's side yard. I was so impressed with the build quality on that car. So we took it apart, sold the interior and everything from it and, and got it down to nothing. And then we're like, how do we fit this engine in here? So we start disassembling the front end we mock in the engine, and I'm like, well, we gotta do the, both the front and rear subframes too, because it can't sit on the old, you know, live axle on the back. So we tear out the rear end, we tear out the front end. Essentially, it's just this four door tub sitting on the floor of my garage. We get a front suspension made, but we're starting to put it together. And if some people have seen the Ferrari video, a 35 feet of a um, redwood tree snap off 100 feet in the air, come down, smash my garage with us in it, working on the Corona. I get thrown under a bench. My friend Peter gets thrown under the car. The roll cage of the car actually supporting part of the roof of the, of the garage. And we get out relatively unscathed. I had a bruised toenail. But the car, the poor Corona, was holding the garage up structurally. And an engineer told us that until we took it apart, the whole garage, we had to leave the car in there, otherwise it might collapse. So the Corona was entombed for an entire year inside the garage. And then construction finally began. We had a party at my house. Unbeknownst to my friends, we were going to take the car out. So we lifted the car out with all the people. We put it on the porch. We got working. And we rebuilt the garage, same thing, another surprise, a party, and surprise, hey guys, we're gonna put some sticks in the window and carry this car up this hillside and into my new garage. We got it inside and got to work. And Peter Ralphs, who is an absolute genius, the guy's built like formula cars and NASCAR and everything. Without him, we could never have done it. And he was the one who helped build the front horns, we hung the suspension on and the rear suspension. So we got, basically a Mark III Supra stuffed under a Corona. We got the one JZ in it and the whole thing, when, b before we took, we took it apart, I think it weighed, when the first race stock, it weighed like 20, 2,080 pounds or something. So now together, it's only a few hundred pounds more. It's 800 pounds lighter than the Supra, which is not something I think Lemons was expecting. The car now is all together. Well, mostly, and it's time to get it ready for its first race. So we signed up for it. And that's when you realize, and people who have built race cars will know this, that it's never ready when you think it's ready. So I invite the team members out and we work for eight days straight from 4 a.m. pretty much till 11. So we're getting four hours of sleep. And then towards the end, we actually worked two days solid. We worked all night, came out the door, the sun was up, we're like, ah, screw it. And we went back to work. And it's Friday for inspection day. And I'm like, we're gonna get it done. And we had to get us an alignment or something. And it was just barely finished. And we're like, it's not finished. So we're like, we call up Lemons. So like, we'll be there Saturday morning. We can tech in the morning. They're like, okay, let's tech in the morning. And then Saturday comes and we worked all night again. And it still wasn't right and working correctly. And so we're like, okay. We'll work through today. We'll just race on Sunday. They said, okay, show up Sunday morning. We'll tech it and you guys can at least get on the track. I'm like, great. It'll be like heroic ending. We'll get on the track. And Sunday comes and it's not finished. And we all weep openly on each other's shoulders. And it was like, oh, all right. I guess we missed it. We lick our wounds and 
I'm like, we're going to do the next race, which is no, not in the area. All the local California races were over for that period, and we had to go to Washington. And that's a thousand miles from my house. And the Ridge, which is an amazing track, if you ever get to go there, tremendous track. And we pretty much do the same thing. I wait till a couple weeks beforehand. And we're like, it's finished. It's not finished. And they fly out. We do the same thing. We hammer on it. We put it on the trailer. We drive to the Ridge. I drove around my house. It seemed fine. It wasn't. Uh, we had a few issues. One being, uh, the Ridge doesn't have fuel. And the one JZ runs on 100 octane. So we had to see if we could make 100 octane, which you can't make 100 octane. We got 91 octane, doesn't run well on it. We went to a local airport, which happened to be open, and we bought a 55 gallon drum of uh, 100 octane leaded, which doesn't work because the oxygen sensor didn't find that appealing. I thought we could get by because we don't have a cat in it, but no, the car started running, so we mixed the two fuels together, and that made things worse. And then we had to sell the mixed fuel, which we end up get walking around the, the pits like, would you like a mixture of leaded and unleaded fuel? Because it would work great in your car. And the guy there had an old Chrysler and we put it in him and it, now leaded fuel smells beautiful. I mean, guys my age remember it. Of course it was killing you at the time, but it smelled great. So the smell of leaded fuel started wafting around in different cars and motor homes we were trying to sell it to. But we got it out on track and we ran into the other issues because Again, I like cheaty, weird stuff, and I wasn't gonna build a car, another part from scratch, if we didn't do cheaty, weird stuff. One thing was I wanted to put the radiator in the back seat, because rally car, like the, the Audi Peak, Pikes Peak car, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Because if you auger the front end, you don't destroy the radiator, you can keep racing. That seems smart to me, was we put it in the back seat, and we had ducting and fans, and we got on the racetrack, and it started overheating, terribly, which might have to do with the crappy fuel, but no, we put some stringers over a, whole, a duct we had made in the trunk. So the air went into the back seat and out the trunk. All the strings, instead of blowing in the wind beautifully out the back, were being sucked into the car. So the air was actually moving backwards towards the radiator while the fans were pushing air towards the, so it was just a static mess of nothing. So that didn't work and we also, uh, we didn't show up with rear fenders because we didn't have time. So there we made, which was the hit of the, the pits, we ended up making right there fenders out of old license plates, which looked fabulous. And the last piece of cheaty thing I wanted to do with the car, I love, one of my favorite cars of all time, and I've had, been fortunate enough to sit in it and, be on, and, and lay hands on it, and that is the 88 Audi Quattro Trans Am car, which is a holy grail car of mine. And one of my favorite things about that is the exhaust pipe that came out the door. And I'm like, I want an exhaust pipe that comes out the door. I want a turbo car where the exhaust pipe that comes out the door and flames coming out of it. So we routed the exhaust through the, <laughs> by, right by the inside, came out of the floor and out the door right next to the driver. And we put like chimney kind of material to protect it so we didn't die of carbon monoxide. And, uh, but it radiated a lot of heat which we hadn't really, you know, worked on that much. I gotta say, we worked on the car a lot, uh, but not enough. And that's always the lemon's way, the, the racing way, is you think you got it all done, but you don't. So we end up doing, in two days and 16 hours of driving, we end up racing uh, 25 laps. And my dad flew up to see the car, and uh, we brought my son, and all of our friends came up, and 1,000 miles and 25 laps. And we got the prestige, we got another award, the prestigious, we got screwed award, which I'm pretty proud of. No, I'm not proud of it at all. It's really kind of uh, awful, but we got it. So we, it's on display at the house. You know, to a lot of people, this stuff sounds ridiculous and there's good reason for it. I mean, to finish this car, the amount of money we spent and the time we spent and the time away from our families, why, why do it? This car meant something to me because of the accident in the, with the redwood tree. And I really felt deep in my soul I had to finish it, like uh, have closure on the car, like get it on its tires and wheels and everything that I had promised to myself in my mind to build it to, to, was to finish it. And that 
was the overwhelming driving desire. Maybe it was a little PTSD from almost being killed, but I'm sure it was a little bit of that. But working a hundred and something hours in one week and, and through the night a couple of times, that's what was driving me. It's like, we had to make it finish. We had to find completion for this car. And cars are always emotional creatures as it is. And I think race cars are doubly so because a regular car, you just drive around and a race car is actually protecting your life and threatening your life simultaneously, some of them more than others. But you had to find a way of getting that car done. So we had a few weeks to finish it and we had all gathered together and flown out. You know, Bradley came out, Don came up, and I now lived up in the mountains. So I was kind of alone with the car most of the time. And I was away from my team. They fly in and I'm trying to finish it desperately and it wasn't gonna get done. And one of those, like you always hope for kind of the Christmas miracle. Like when I wake up, the elves will have finished it. And that race car were a few times, I wish I had some elves. And guess what? I got some elves. And what happened was I called a friend and his son lived up where we were. And uh, Gavin was like 16 when he helped us out with the Supra originally. Um, his dad was on the team at the time. And Gavin was now in his 20s and an aspiring drift racer and all kinds of things. And he was deep in the cars. He's like, yeah, I'll come over and help. I'm like, oh, that is fantastic. And anybody who's built or restored a car, you know, when you get the, you get a little bit of help that when you're really in the weeds, you know, it's just the warm and fuzzies and you feel like you can breathe for a moment. Not only did he do that, he contacted another guy who he didn't really well, know that well, but he knew lived in Auburn close to me named uh, Matt Leyland, who eventually now works for me because he's a brilliant mechanic. So he grabs Matt and Matt grabs his friend Travis and these three young 20 year old kids show up at my door and they're like, what do you need? I'm like, oh, I need everything. And went through the list and they were the elves. And we just started knocking stuff out. I mean, we, that car would not be where it is at all without the three of them. And uh, Matt and Gavin are with us to this day as our crew. They don't ask for money. They don't ask for thanks. They just do it because they love cars. And that gives me hope, great hope. Like here's the younger generation. And they just, they said, I was like, what do you want? Like of course we, you know, we bought them dinner or whatever they needed. We paid for their gas or, you know, what they were doing was great and helpful. And they're like, no, we don't need anything. We just wanted to work on a race car. And I was like, well, sorry, um, I don't have a race car, but we do have this Corona you can work on. And they tirelessly and selfishly helped to get that car done. Avalon King has been a supporter of the VinWiki channel for the last four years, and we can't thank them enough for that. And I have it honestly on all my cars. There's a ton of ceramic coatings on the market, but not many of them are truly DIY products where an idiot like me can actually put them on. We've done a lot of collaborative projects. We've got a lot of interesting things coming up with Avalon King, and we can't thank them enough for their support of the channel. But if you'd like to try it out on your car, I think you'll love the hydrophobic properties, the resistance to scratching, the ease of cleaning, and honestly, how good the cars look. So be sure to check them out at the link in the description below and use the code VinWiki for a discount.